Good morning and welcome to Rad Chat, multi-award winning therapeutic radio for lead oncology podcast. My name is Jay McNamara and I'm joined by fellow host Norman Joel Anderson. Hi everyone. So we have an amazing guest on this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. You're welcome. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Mark McEntee. I'm Professor of Diagnostic Radiography in University College Cork in Ireland and I'm Head of the Discipline of Medical Imaging and Radiation Therapy there. Now I've got a soft spot for the Irish accent and we've had a lot of Irish people on the podcast. <laughs> She's during... sitting very close to you as well. <laughs> <laughs> during UKIO. So people are going to be like, you've purposely reached out to all those Irish people so you can listen to their sultry tones. <laughs> well, I hope they can understand us. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, what brought you to UKIO? I'm here over at the research hub actually, so an opportunity came up this year to gather data. So I'm really trying to focus on just gathering data. I'm trying to stay away from all the interesting discussions and chats and uh, and conference presentations, unfortunately, and just get in on gathering data. We're looking at the effect of AI prompts on reader behavior. So we're tracking their eyes while they're looking at chest x-rays and seeing what the AI prompt does to that. So... More to be talked about on that later. Yeah, Results we've already imminent. said, haven't we? Let's get you on. <laughs> yeah. what, what got you into healthcare in the first place? Um, you know, it, it's funny. It's uh, Everybody has that sort of first memory of an x-ray, of, of the dislocated thumb, and I went for an x-ray, and uh, it just put it in my mind from a very young age. But I always wanted to be an architect. Oh, right. Uh, so, <laughs> Slightly different. So yeah, in the, in the Irish system, you get given offers, yeah. and I had an offer of architecture in the in the, in the Republic of Ireland, an offer of radiography in in, in Ulster, and uh, just it just came down to at the end of the day, it came down to fees, you know, yeah. at the time, and uh, went up and went up to Ulster, and uh, you never look back. I really didn't know what it was properly. Yeah. I think that's that's one of the things, you know. Sometimes when you make a decision, it just takes its own legs and runs off with itself. I, you know, I wouldn't say that I necessarily knew what I was getting myself into. My poor lecturers in, in <laughs> University of Ulster, Billy Ray and Neil Thompson, they were pulling their hair out, wondering what this guy's up to. But you know, I've slowly, slowly found my fit. Um, got into very quickly. I, even as a student, enjoyed teaching other students, and then. When, the minute I became a qualified radiographer, I was always pulling students with me and, and bringing them along. So very, very quickly found that I wanted to be an educator in radiography. And again, it's no way you could have planned it. Yeah. But getting getting closer to the university then by becoming a practice tutor and then showing an interest in wanting to teach, that's what pulled me more towards the university. So I was in. I was actually working as a radiographer for quite a short period of time before I got into academia. I was. I was a bit of a bookworm. Yeah. So uh, yeah, that's that's sort of a, that was my pathway into health education. Yeah. What was your area of specialty once you qualified? I, IT really. Right. I was always like the techie guy. Yeah. I loved the, once packs started coming in. I was really interested in how it works, and that was all that people want to see was some sort of interest and, you know, end up being effectively like the person who they went to with PAX issues or going to the meetings about the PAX. Yeah. So when I started lecturing, I started teaching the, the you know, uh, the technology as well as the, the technique. So um, this whole AI, yeah. which I think, I think most of our guests have mentioned AI. Yeah, like you can't avoid it at the moment. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's, in the, it's in the general interest media, it's in the health media. But uh, you know, I think we need to be on top of it. It yeah. moves you know, like radiographers and radiation therapists have always been fantastic at using the latest and greatest, and showing ourselves capable of taking on new technologies and building them into our practice. So we can't get left behind on this one either. Yeah. You know, it's unlikely to die in the ditch. You know, it's 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 uh, you know it's coming a long way. It can do an awful lot, but there are dangers. Yeah. Um, there be dragons, so uh, I think it's important to be aware of those too. And it's often the case that the product comes out, and then you know the academics and the scientists are investigating the impact of using it, uh, and that's that's when some of the, um, the sort of the, the uh, cautionary tales emerge. Uh, so yeah, definitely on board with it, but. Uh, yeah, m- more looking at it from the perspective of how we use it rather than how we develop it, or how yeah. we, we're not we're not on really on the development side or the uh, algorithm side at all. Yeah. Do you think AI will make people lazy? <laughs> well, I, I think that it will it will change the decision making process. 
I think it will definitely be an extra piece of information. I think that the, the human mind takes shortcuts. You know, we're prone to the, if there's a shortcut there, we'll take it. If the answer is, you know, in your in your maths problem, if the answer is in the back of the book, who doesn't sneak a look? Yeah. And if you you have an AI prompt that's there, um, and it, you know, it could potentially save you some time, I think people will use it for that reason. Then you're going to have the issue of satisfaction of search. You know, do you stop searching because it, it has confirmed what you thought, and you don't yeah. look? You know, the Americans would say that you know the patient paid for all of their image. You know. And people stop looking once they find the pathology. So I think there's a risk with satisfaction of search. And I definitely think there's a risk with um, younger trainee radiologists that they stop systematically searching. You know, that they, they shortcut their search um, in preference for a confirmation that the AI system is, is right. But it's only ever going to be as good as its training set. And the training sets will have flaws in it. We know about the inherent biases within all training sets. Um, so I, I think um, I think people will get lazy at their own peril because it's still going to come back down to the fact that the patient will have a misdiagnosis of the patient, and that, you know it's the individual that's going to uh, the individual reporter that's going to end up having to justify their decision, even if that decision includes oh well the AI told me it was it was clear. You know, you can't delegate responsibility to the system. So I've definitely seen some behavior that would be worrying, um, but uh, we need more evidence, I think, to, to, you know, I think we need more evidence to show how we use it, like search first, look later, that type of thing. How are you tracking people when they're doing We use an eye tracker, so it's a very simple sort of infrared camera that picks out the, the eyes, the retina of the eyes, it looks for little eye movements called saccades, so this is where your eyes rapidly move from one place to another. And then we look at fixations, so that's when you stare at a thing for a certain length of time. And a combination of the statistics of saccades and fixations and, uh, and the movement between fixations gives us uh, information about how they're searching, what, what directions they go, where they go first, do they go to the prompt first, or do they go to the, uh, the, the, to the cancer first, or um, how long they look, that's a big, like how long have they searched for, when did they give up, um, and all of those sort of things. So that it's, it's basically a fancy infrared camera that sits in front of their eyes and, and monitors them as they, as they search on the x ray yeah. So interesting. Yeah, it is, so interesting. it is, yeah. They're heavily used in advertising and marketing and uh, web development to see where people look on a website. But they're less so used in radiology, um, but when we do use them, they always add something extra to your methodology. If we could do our research with just looking at search time, how long do people, does it take? And I think there would be a big difference. I think AI does shorten search time, but understanding why it shortened it, you need the eye tracker to do that. Yeah. So, one of the reasons uh, we were privileged enough to get to be introduced to you was around the work that you've done in mammography. Yeah. So we've recently released a mammography series via yeah. Instagram um, for patients to try and promote the use of mammography and attend the screening. Can you tell us a little bit about your research? Yeah, I mean, I'm interested in mammography for multiple different reasons. Um, one of them is breast density and the impact of breast density on sensitivity and specificity and survival. Yeah. Uh, and another one is um, the social implications of, um, of a person's background and how they access screening. So um, while, uh, while I was in, in Australia, I, um, I was privileged to work with um, members of the indigenous community looking at access rates um, of the indigenous community to the, to the screening service. And what was very clear in the statistics over there is that uh, Indigenous women attend breast screening at a much lower rate than other categories of people in Australia. And, and, and the reasons are multiple. First of all, it's, um, first of all, the system is set up typically for uh, white middle class women. Yeah. You know, you get an appointment sent to an address. That, that appointment is at a time that assumes that you're not working. That appointment is at a time that assumes that you can travel, and um, and then you go in, and it's a you know it's an environment that is familiar to to people who access private healthcare, for example. It's a well kept, quite staid, formal environment. There are no signs and symbols to sort of say, indigenous people 
built this place or, or from this or, or work here even. Yeah. It's not a welcoming environment. And so that sort of learning from the early stages of that work in Australia, when I came back to Ireland I started looking at the Irish traveller women and their experience and we did a small uh, focus group study asking them about their experiences of mammography and we actually found an awful lot of parallels. First of all, women's health remains a taboo topic in, in certain ethnic groups and the Irish traveller community are recognised um, ethnic group within Ireland as they are in England actually. The Irish and English traveller community intermingle, intermix all of the time. There, there's only about 30,000 of them, but they live on average 11.5 years less. A, a traveller woman lives 11.5 years less than a non-traveller woman in Ireland. And this is a rich European country. And, and it's not just breast cancer, it's all cancers, but particularly breast cancer, it's a taboo topic. They can't speak to their husbands about it. Women's health is, uh, is, is off the agenda. So you can imagine then if your husband controls resources and if, if they have access to the car or if they have access to the money and you're asking, you know, I need to go to a breast care appointment and we're just not talking about that. Um, so when speaking to the women we found certain, certain barriers that are evident for them that are not evident for other women. So for example, um, appointments are not received because they're sent in, uh, in the post to the last known address, which is, you know, send it to someone with no fixed abode. Yeah. These are traveler yeah. women, uh, and the, the, the clue is in the title, you know, so yeah. the screening service would say, and absolutely, they, their, their heart is in the right place, they would say they don't discriminate. Yeah. But it's almost the same as saying, I don't see color. Yeah. It's like, you need you to see, see it, color, yeah. because there are differences. Yeah. So, uh, we don't treat traveler women any different to, to non traveler women. It's like, you need to, because they have different barriers. And it's, it is this issue of equality versus equity. Everybody is treat, treated equally, but there is no equity. Oh, we send out the same letter to everyone in the post. Yes, but some people don't receive it. That's not our problem. Actually, it is. And so that, that would be one barrier. So a simple, like in Canada and in Rest Queen Atherea and Lucet in New Zealand, they just fix that with text messages. You know, you, you, you can send it out via text. And that's a simple fix, in theory. Yeah. But then putting in place the IT system that will send the text messages is a project for the health system that is worthwhile. Yeah. But getting, the, getting it across that it's worthwhile. You'll also, you also come across the barrier inside the system and they'll say, oh, well, we don't gather the information about their ethnicity because that's protected data. And sometimes GDPR is thrown up as a sort of, oh, we can't collect that because it's protected classification of data. And it is. But there are many uh, reasons why you're allowed to breach, uh, if you like, you're allowed to gather data when it's good for the person and good for the population. So I think there's a discussion to be had about, you know, looking after minority ethnic groups and, and to know about them, we need to gather data on them. So those barriers, at the very simplest point of not receiving your invite are there. Then the appointments being at inappropriate times. One of the women said to us, um, like if I get an appointment at nine o'clock, I, I can't make it. Like I have to get everybody up, I have to get them ready, fed, dressed, out the door. And if I left the, the halting site, is where this person lived, if I left the halting site before 11 o'clock, there'd be a search party sent out for me. Where did I go? Yeah. You know, I don't, like, you almost have to let everybody know where you're going. It's not permission, but it's also communication that you're going to leave because, and, and so, but, you know, just even the ability to choose your time is another barrier that, that, that is there. And then, if you did manage to get into the screening service, then there's people looking at you and judging you. Yeah. They're coming across, and this bias is there all of the time. It's like, the people in Ireland and in England would look at someone and make an assessment that they were traveling yeah. and then say things and then make assumptions and you know and almost health problems are seen as well that's their own fault yeah. whereas we would never see that say that about anybody else it's like oh well you know if you don't look after your health 
So when they're there, they feel judged, they feel looked at, they don't feel welcomed. One one woman told the story of you know being asked for her address, you know, four or five times, and, and being sent away because she she couldn't give them an address, and therefore they, they wouldn't follow up with the appointment. So what you need is a you know you need a, an understanding that people will come from different backgrounds. Um, one of the one of the suggestions that came out of the in, in, you know Breast Screen uh, Canada and Breast Screen New Zealand and Australia was this idea of having bringing the service to them. Mobile you. Yeah. And, and having a day in which you're there with your sisters and your cousins and your aunts and you just go in together. You're not judged. Yeah. You know you, you can have some fun around it. You know imaging and therapy don't have to be so serious. Yeah. You know, it's a serious business, but there's lots of fun people involved with it, like yourselves. Every, you everyone know? always says, though, I can't remember who I was talking to, some of the diagnostic students yesterday, and they were saying, you know, it, it was really surprising when they went into the radio therapy department, and they said it was, everyone was really happy. Yeah. And it, they actually said it was the nicest, cheeriest place that they'd gone to yeah. in that hospital setting. Yeah. And I think a lot of that is around that peer support, yeah. The fact that people feel quite isolated, yeah. potentially going through a cancer diagnosis and a pathway, and then they get somewhere and everyone's in a similar situation that they automatically have a bond yeah. because they're sharing similar emotions and feelings. Absolutely. And I think being with people who understand your background and your journey yeah. it makes it easier for you. So if you're in there having a breast screen and there's another traveller woman beside you, you understand the difficulty of the fact that you're probably going to be able, you, you can talk about this to other women but you can't talk about it to you know your, your partner um, there's a high you know there's a, there's a you know large levels of domestic violence there, there there's difficulties with accessing services of other types follow-ups you know you go for your screening you get your diagnosis cancer is a like there's there are beliefs in, in many cultures that cancer is contagious or that you did something to bring it on yourself and so you don't get the support you know we, we hear stories of people saying you know well the re you know um, the reason why this happened to me is because I I breached some rule of my community and, and so they, they feel almost a guilt at the diagnosis but having other people around you that understand that that can be there and you know the peer support as you said would be really critical for for uh, for an uh, indigenous and tra uh, traveller women. So I think it's a real area of need. Now we only scratched the surface on this. Like yeah. we haven't implemented any solutions whatsoever. I have spoken to the screening service, and and they are on top of it. Right. You know they, they say they have plans in place, and they you know that things will happen, and and we look forward to seeing those. Um, but it's. Like a, any simple solution to a complex problem is usually wrong. Yeah. You know, it's it's a complex solution uh, with multiple layers to it. So. Yeah. yeah, I think you touched on some really important factors. So, for example, in Australia, I think there's over 120 different dialects of Aboriginal people. Yeah. You know, that's going to have a huge barrier for people for accessing care. Then yeah. women also do well, the most unpaid social and healthcare work, looking after families at home and stuff like that. Yeah. There's so many different things that we just don't consider. I think we definitely have to get you on for a full hour. <laughs> <laughs> but you mentioned uh, breast density. So yeah. that's episode 82 yeah. for anyone that's listening. Oh, was it? And Noel Clerk in 86, um, which was great about mammography as well. So if you haven't listened, you should probably do that as yeah, well. Yeah, 86 and 82. Yeah, brilliant. I will. Now, breast density is a fascinating subject because if you're... If you're um, breasts are dense, you're six times more likely to develop breast cancer than someone who has a fatty breast, which, you know, that's getting out there into the community. And now what we've seen in, um, across the United States, pretty much every state now, thanks to the, thanks to the work of, um, you know, advocacy groups like Are You Dense and, um, uh, and uh, My Breast Density, they've managed to get it as, as part of the insurance programs in most of the states in America that you you know if you have dense breasts you get an ultrasound or an MRI on your insurance so that's that's fantastic for the American environment but one of the big issues is that women aren't being told that they have dense breasts so in like uh, and, and one of the fears it's sort of this patriarchal but actually nowadays it's still it's matriarchal because healthcare is mainly female 
Um, the, this idea that we don't want to tell you that because we don't, you, you know, you don't need to know that. Because what are you going to do about it? But time and time again, we'll say to people, patients are the best advocates. If you tell someone that they've got dense breasts, they will find out what that means. They will understand what it means, and they will make their own decisions. Some people will choose to do nothing about that. Some people will choose to investigate that further. That's their choice. So I think the ESOB guidelines, so the Euro European Association of Breast Imaging, they, their guidelines have now recommended that um, women with dense breasts get an MRI or recommended for it. So that's a fantastic move forward for, for women in Europe. The issue is now going to be access to services because MRIs are not cheap. They're fully occupied at the moment. But, but, it, but at least the guidelines are there for someone to argue that someone needs dense breasts. So like the research that we've done ranges across things like, for example, um, we, we, we look at um, the performance of people uh, di diagnosing on breast dense. So we, we work with uh, University of Sydney, Ernest Echo, Professor Patrick Brennan, and um, we looked at the effect of the density on people's search patterns. We looked at the effect of the density on their detection of the lesions. So not only are you more likely to get the cancer, yeah. but it's more likely to happen in between screens and it's more likely to be missed when someone's looking at it. And uh, that's, th that's three issues that are associated. But recently, looking at the survival characteristics five and ten years out, what we've actually found, and this is very new information and it's been published, is that although these women get cancer more often and although they're diagnosed late, they die less frequently from them than people who develop the cancers in the fatty areas. Which is great news for women with dense breasts because it's only been a bad news story so far. So actually the, the, the survival rate is higher in women with dense breasts once diagnosed compared to those with fatty breasts. The, why, you might ask. It's likely because we've always thought about fat as being this inert, like inert, almost plasticized material that sits around our hips and our <laughs> thumb and uh, places we don't want it. Abdominal. And it, do, it does nothing but sit there. But in fact, it's power, it's yeah. energy. Anybody who's on the keto diet will know, like, where are they getting their food from if they're not eating carbs? Well, they're getting it from their fat. Yeah. Your body will use that, especially uh, an anaerobic cancer that's not getting a blood supply. It will pull it from the fat. So what's likely happening is that these tumors in fatty tissue have more survival ability, longer longevity, more resilient yeah. than those that are in dense tissues. Although the dense tissue gives them an architecture to grow, doesn't give them the power, the power source that they need. So that's that was we, we, we looked at the first plots of survival there, and I think that that's a, a good news story among the breast density worries. That if, if you do have dense breasts and you are diagnosed, your your likelihood of survival is actually higher than someone who has fattier breasts. Um, I don't know. This, I always try to say around breast density, there aren't very many good public health messages in it, yeah. because being Overweight pre-puberty is protective, but then being underweight post-puberty is protective. Who does that? Yeah. It's not that common. Uh, it's exposure to estrogen that seems to drive the density all throughout uh, life, so exposure in the womb. Uh, so like uh, larger babies have denser breasts. Like one of these things can be controlled. The only things that can control your breast density are exercise. So. Uh, uh, less alcohol, like these, we know about these things already. Um, breastfeeding, more for longer with more kids, and having kids. So some of these are lifestyle choices as well. Like so, yeah, you know, if, if a, a woman who uh, breastfeeds multiple kids is going to have lower breast density than a woman who has no children. Um, yeah, and it's like some of the words that are used around this. So nulliparity. Uh, having no children is a heavily associated with having dense breasts and, and that increases your risk. So um, very few good public health messages around, around us, not much you can do. A little bit, a little bit that can be done but I think it, it is good news that the screening services there can find these things, get screened, check your breasts, know your own breasts. Some people have lumpy breasts and that's the density that they're feeling yeah. but at least if you know your own 
again. Um, you know, uh, it, 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 it's a good start. And then you know, when you get an appointment for screening, go. One and question. Ask that question. Yeah. Yeah, do I have to express? And, and the answer might be yes, you do, and there's not much we can do about it. Well, actually, you can get an ultrasound. Some yeah. people might have the resources to pay for that themselves. Others, it might be covered with their insurance. Um, you can and be more we, rest aware. We have done some work with um, two students actually called Raducational. So yeah. They do a lot of social describing, and often diagnostic radiographers, mammographers, sonographers don't necessarily utilise that as a learning opportunity for patients. So when you're talking about breast density and talking about alcohol reduction, exercise, that would be the perfect opportunity, wouldn't it, if you're talking about dense breasts, yeah. what the impact of that is, but also some social prescribing as well at that time. Absolutely. Now we, we, have that per we have that moment in which you have the person's total focus. At that moment, they're not thinking about anything else other than their breast health. You know, because it's very hard to focus on your on your health, but when you're getting your, your breast x-rayed in a mammogram, you know, you're, you're naked, you're alone in many ways, and you're you're thinking about nothing else. And in that moment is a great moment to sort of speak to people about, about this who have their complete focus. But I think that uh, uh, every opportunity should be taken. You know, it's, it's such an important area. One of, one of the, the real risks here is that if people don't attend the service, you know, there, there's a constant risk benefit analysis, economic analysis going on with the government in the background, you know, yeah. that it, it costs more if you don't, if you don't attend, it costs the service more. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that might be a small consideration, but it's important that we keep these services and by, by using them and attending. And if you're younger and you're worried about this, you know, speak to your GP. Younger women often ask, like, why don't you do mammography earlier? And it's useless usually because the breast is too dense. So in that case, things like ultrasound and MRI are very useful. If you have a family history, an MRI is more useful. Than ever. Well, we can't wait to get you on for a full episode because I think we have so many more questions to ask you. Um, but this is just like a taster oh, for yeah. people. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> thank been, you. it's been great to speak to you. Yeah. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you.